Hi, everyone. Hi, welcome to Brewbaker House's first ever virtual event. Um, my name is Laura Enns. And I'm Joshua. We are the current hosts of Brewbaker House at the University of Waterloo, and we'll be the hosts of tonight's Zoom event. We're so glad that you could join us to celebrate the launch of our exciting new digital exhibit, Life Upstairs. Just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Um, this event will run for about an hour, and we will also be recording the event and sharing the recording afterward on the exhibit website and Grable's YouTube channel. You will all be muted for the duration of the event, but you're welcome to turn your video cameras on or off throughout the event as you wish. Uh, so good evening. As we come together tonight to learn uh, a bit more about the history of live-in hosts here at the Brewmaker House, we recognize the story of our human presence on the land does not begin with our first host moving in in 1979, or even with the Brubaker family settlement here. We humbly acknowledge the historical and enduring presence of Indigenous peoples on this land since time immemorial. And we're situated today, um, you might see the backdrop here is just a stone wall. Um, of the basement of the Brubaker House. So we're on the traditional territory here of the Adawandron, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee people. And this house is on the Haldeman Tract, land granted in 1784 to the Six Nations. Uh, that includes six kilometer, or 10 kilometers, six miles on either side of the Grand River. Uh, it was a house built by Mennonites, and Mennonites were the first permanent white settlers in the region here. Initial settlers were led to the Grand River with its surrounding fertile soil and forests by uh, a guide from the Mississauga of the Anishinaabe people who lived here and understood the land. In 1805, a specific group of Mennonites from Pennsylvania purchased a large area, 60,000 acres of present day Kitchener Waterloo on what was then called Lock 2 of the Haldeman's Track. And in 1846, John E. Brubaker with his wife Magdalena Musselman built the house that we're in right now the Brubaker House on lot 25 of that larger purchase. And you can see up here on the, the screen, um, that is a picture there of the Haldeman Tract um, and that dark shaded in area um, that was up there a moment ago is the, the section that we're on right now in KW. So today, it's 175 years later, uh, Mennonites such as ourselves, so this is a photo of, of my, me and, and Laura and our son Oren, who live here at the Brubaker House, uh, we settle and we live on this land um, all, not just here in KW, but all along the length of the Haldeman Tract, land that was intended to be leased to support the Six Nations in perpetuity and not sold outright. Our work at Reconciliation with Indigenous Peoples includes decolonizing our historical understandings and narratives and attitudes and working to come to an understanding of and uphold uh, treaties that have often been forgotten by settlers. This is an ongoing pro process. We have a long way to go, but we do this in humility and gratitude to our Indigenous neighbors, uh, both past and present. For those who may be unfamiliar with Brubaker House, um, Brubaker House is a 19th century heritage house overlooking Columbia Lake on the University of Waterloo's North Campus. It is owned by the University of Waterloo and operated in partnership with Conrad Grable University College and the Mennonite Historical Society of Ontario. Usually from May through October, we would be open for tours um, and taking people through the beautiful field stone house that the Brubaker family that their 14 children lived in from 1850 to 1902. Currently, we are closed for in-person tours, um, but are excited today to be launching the museum's first digital exhibit. As current hosts of Brubaker House, we have had the privilege of welcoming thousands of visitors to the museum over the past five years and sharing stories with them about our region's history and Pennsylvania German Mennonite life and culture as they tour the museum. Uh, one of the more dramatic events in the Brubaker House's history, um, which is really uh, instrumental in the start of the museum, was a really destructive fire that took place in 1968. And this was just before the university was planning on restoring 
the building. And here's a picture of what it looked like just after um, the fire ran its toll on, on the house here, leaving really only the stone walls um, that you can see even behind us standing still. And fortunately, the university decided to continue with the restoration and they hired a local Mennonite carpenter, Simeon Martin, to rebuild the house using hand tools, providing authentic detail. Um, and we have some hewn beams that are uh, nicely presented throughout the museum, uh, thanks to him. Uh, at this point, the upper level of the home was originally the children's bedrooms, uh, and it was then converted during that restoration to a two bedroom apartment for live in hosts. And those People were, I guess, set up to be the custodians of the museum, and we opened to the public in 1979. So this is the tradition of living hosts uh, at the Brubaker House, um, living upstairs and running the museum on the main floor, and it's continued for about 45 years. And when museum visitors learn that we actually live here, uh, often they're pretty shocked. This is kind of a fun part of the tour when we when we, we bring people through the house and they're really interested about what is it like to live in, in the museum here. And often they're just as interested about that as they are about the history of the actual house and, and the Brubakers. Um, sometimes we forget how unique it is to live in this host-like arrangement. Um, where our family manages the museum and gardens and coordinates tours and events in exchange for accommodation in the upstairs apartment. It struck us um, just as we were thinking about this that the story of the live-in hosts at the house might be one worth digging into. And for us living upstairs has really provided a deeper insight into the house and the land surrounding it. And when we invite guests to the house, they have a sense that they're really entering someone's home, allowing them to actually live the history that they're learning about and experience Mennonite culture and hospitality in a real way. Living here as hosts, we really shape the museum as we um, highlight certain parts of the programming we're excited about. And in turn, we're really shaped by the museum. It's kind of a mutual relationship between the host and the house. And that's what we wanna explore in our digital exhibit life upstairs. So before we dive into the exhibit, I'd like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors, the Mennonite Historical Society of Ontario for their financial support of this digital history project to the J. Winfield Fretz Publication Fund and their ongoing Brubaker House program funding, as well as Conrad Grable University College communications staff, Margaret Gissing and Jen Conkle, for their help in promoting the exhibit and providing tech support for tonight's event. This project has come about through Brubaker House's Artist in Residence program. Since 2017, uh, we have welcomed seasonal artists in residence, local emerging or professional artists and artisans, broadly defined, to create and share work inspired by Brubaker House and its history. The program also provides opportunities for artists to engage with the community through participatory arts workshops. Since 2017, we have welcomed six artists in residence, and tonight I'm so thrilled to introduce to you the Brubaker House 2021 Digital Historian in Residence and Curator of Life Upstairs, Bethany Lees. Bethany grew up in Waterloo Region and studied Mennonite studies at the University of Waterloo, she has a master's in library and information science and a passion for Mennonite history. Bethany and her husband, Brandon, um, were also co-hosts at Brubaker House from 2006 to nine. And they were actually the ones who first introduced me to the museum when I was a youth, uh, volunteering there on Canada Day. So working with Bethany on this project has felt like coming full circle and I'm so grateful for the creativity, vision, and expertise that she has brought to Life Upstairs and for her amazing dedication and the countless hours that she has contributed to bringing it to life. And now I'd like to invite Bethany to say a few words about the project. So I think we're good to go, Bethany. I think you're muted. You might want to unmute there. We can't. Oh, we 
I'm going to hold down the space bar. We'll Sorry. figure it out. Wait, we were trying to unmute that whole time, but we couldn't. We lived in a museum. We struggled <laughs> with technology of, of certain kinds. Give us a horse and plow. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. So uh, what drew me to this project was, yeah, what Laura and Josh were saying. Um, a lot of people asked um, asked about the fact that we lived upstairs and thought it was really interesting that we lived in a museum. And I liked um, that people were interested in that. And I wanted to hear other people's stories because we had some interesting stories too. Um, I, I started the project by creating some survey questions and I sent those out to the, the hosts who are still living. There are several who, who have passed away, and so I contacted their families. Um, I really appreciated Ralph Bean's um, input, and his, like, he, was, he sent a lot of emails with me, and um, he did a lot of work. He is, he is the nephew of Dorothy Bean, who was one of the first hosts, and he transcribed all of her diaries, which made it so easy for me to work with. And he had an album of their time there. So it was lovely that he had all these things from her. I also interviewed um, with Lucille Weber, who is a sister of Carol Weber, another, um, another host who has passed on. And she was very willing to tell lots of stories of their of their times there. And um, there were some children of the Huntsberger family who sent photos and and gave some information as well. Um, I also spent time in the Mennonite Archives of Ontario. I looked at the Brubaker House minutes and, um, as I said, Dorothy Bean's diaries. And I found lots of images on the Mennonite archival image database that were connected to the Brubaker House as well. There was even some University of Waterloo um, research that I did with the Waterloo record. They had their archives there, and there were a number of photos. Some weren't weren't usable because they weren't in the in a, a good state, but um, we were able to use some from there as well. I thought it was really interesting reading everybody's stories, and there's a lot of overlap, like flooding in the basement and critters in the attic and things like that. That was everybody seemed to have those stories but then there is unique experiences um i was chatting with laura during this process about um the fact that we when we were there ron sexsmith he came to visit and laura remembered that because that was the canada day that she was there so she remembers telling him not to touch things and he was probably one of the worst visitors of trying to touch everything but we were we were glad that he was there and we got a, we actually had more visitors come because they were coming to see Ron Sexsmith and they wanted to volunteer and be there just in case he did come. Um, some challenges of this was that I was relying on the host to respond to to uh, create the exhibit so I could only proceed to the creating portion once I had the, those responses. And that was even waiting for our responses. So we had to get together and answer the questions. That, and we, we were one of the last ones because I, well, I kind of knew what we were going to say too. But um, people were busy. And um, so I, that made the process take a little bit longer. But what I found, um, let me read through my notes here what I was going to say next. Um, oh, uh, one thing that I found a, a commonality was uh, people's appreciation for history and for nature. Uh, that was even in um, what the photo album that I had from Dorothy Bean. There were so many photos of the, the nature around, which was very different than it is now. And from like all the birds and the geese, tons of geese photos and other um, tree, yeah, trees and different things around. The property and I just noticed that that a lot of the hosts they also said that they really appreciated the nature around them there. Um, I was also interested in the switch at the beginning, there were a lot of older couples retired couples that that's what that was a focus that's where they wanted to hire uh, retired couples and I thought that was interesting that, for example, the gimbal family they were they had a home in Waterloo and they chose to move to the Brubaker house for a couple of years and then move back to their home 
Um, and I don't know if they, I didn't ask if, whether they rented out their home or, or how that happened, um, but that they would do that in their retirement. I found that interesting. And then the, the switch when Arlen and Judith moved into a younger couple, I wondered um, why that happened. And Paul Penner was able to clarify that, that it was, well, that's where the applicants were younger younger people were applying for this position and so then they started looking at those and then that's been the pattern ever since that they sorry that they hire some hire younger couples and and then that's why there's lots of babies that were born there which <laughs> is also a really unique thing that can their babies continuing to be born hopefully in the new year as well uh, <laughs> and um Anyways, I, I found it a very interesting process and I'm really glad that we can share this with with everyone and I want to thank Laura and Chris for for all of the, the time that you guys have put into it and yeah, I will pass it on to, to Chris to show you some of the parts of it. Thank you. I'll just quickly introduce Chris. Thanks so much, Bethany. Um, I'm sure that folks can't wait to explore the exhibit. Um, and so, yeah, I'll pass it over to Chris in just a moment. Um, Chris and his wife, Julian, Jillian, sorry, were also hosts at Brubaker House from 2004 to 2006. So just before Brandon and Bethany. Uh, since then, he has launched a career as a freelance graphic and web designer, which together with his passion for history and his intimate knowledge of Brubaker House made him a perfect partner on this project. Chris has gone above and beyond in his work on Life Upstairs, and I'm so excited for all of you to see the site that he has created. So over to you, Chris. Laura, um, I just I just want to start by by thanking you, Laura and Josh, for having had such a great idea. Um, it was always um, difficult to articulate. And, and maybe it was a privacy thing too, when people would come and tour the museum and um, we, would, we would say, oh yeah, they, they'd, they'd like round the corner from the parlor and they'd be like, well, what's up there? And we're like, no, keep, keep moving on, that's our place. So it's, it's really cool that um, uh, it's a neat idea and I, and I hope it serves as a, um, as, a, as a long lasting thing that can be linked to and, and so you don't have to show people upstairs. You can basically kind of convey that that uh, legacy. And um, and thanks also to Bethany for doing such a good job at tying it together. Um, when we had our initial meetings, and I know you had been working on it long before that, um, it was a little overwhelming to be like, okay, how how are we gonna <laughs> how are we gonna do this? Um, so I'm uh, I'm really pleased with how it came together and the hard work that both of you um, put into it as well um, does not go unnoticed. Um, so I'm going to share the screen here so we can see the digital exhibit. Um, I was joking with someone uh, the other day and I said, oh yeah, we're doing a digital exhibit. And they said, oh, what's that? I said, well, it's a fancy word for a website. So that's what we're looking at right now. Um, and so you can go to it on your own device. Um, the link is now live. Um, there was a coming soon page, um, but it is uh, lifeupstairs.ca. And um, just to point out a couple things about the website, um, thanks to uh, everyone, all of the hosts who submitted photos, because they really, um, we, we discovered very early on that, that photos tell a heck of a lot of the story um, in this exhibit uh, because it, it just so um, so different, such a wide variety of photos. And I want to thank also Jackie, who provided a lot of a lot of photography, um, being um, becoming a photographer at Brubaker House or before. But um, we've never met Jackie, but our uh, I feel like. Um, it's just a passing of the torch, being able to take a bunch of the photos that you have uh, provided and be able to incorporate them as well. So thanks very much for that. And so if you're on the main page, just a couple things to point out. Um, <clears throat> we, we start off with the question, what would it be like to live in a museum? Because that's a question that, our, that we all remember telling friends and having been hosts at the Brubaker House 
we, um, you know, kind of in passing, telling, telling, sharing your life story with, with people you meet and whatever, it's like, oh yeah, well, by the way, I lived in a museum for a couple of years <laughs> back, back in my early adulthood. Uh, so it just seems like such a, a surreal thing to be able to tell people. And what struck me was also just the number of, of shared experiences with all the hosts, like all the things that we held in common with each other, but the fact that every host had their own unique experience. And so I hope that we can kind of share that in this exhibit. And so on the, on the main page, we break things down into the people. And so we have uh, a section that talks about, basically gives you the timeline of all the Brubaker House hosts, and you can read about who they were and what they did and the years that they were there. And then also we have a stories page, which you can find at the top as well. And so we broke things down, Bethany, I, I'm gonna say we a lot, but it was Bethany who broke these into nine, um, nine stories, kind of pulling from all the surveys and all the information that she had. And so we thought it was a good idea to put them into different stories. So we've broken them up into upstairs apartment, basically talking about the apartment itself, this old house, all the, all the housing, uh, all the interesting things about living in a heritage home, uh, Canada day, all the experiences there, celebrations that took place, family life, visitors, visitors, visitors of interest, uh, changes to the North campus while we were there. Uh, many people were there and there were no other buildings and slowly the tech park has grown. So it's interesting to see so many of those photos of construction, harvesting at the Brubaker house and just um, memories that people have. And you'll see throughout, if you click on the upstairs apartment, for example, what, the way we've tried to set it up is sometimes we go chronologically, but basically we're grouping things into topics. So we talk about some memories of the kitchen and this is um, from early on Arlen and Judith's picture of the kitchen and then comparing that to Laura and Josh's picture. And if you ever kind of get lost and you're like, oh yeah, who were Arlen and Judith? Um, you can click on their name and it's going to bring up that lovely picture circa 2000 <laughs> um, of, their, uh, of their time. And you could say, well, who are Laura and Joshua? Oh, there they are as well. So we've just tried to make it easy for you to navigate around. And there are little, um, there are also, you can, you can click on any of the images viewing it larger. Uh, we wanted the images to take up quite a bit of space, but obviously you can't always see the detail. So you're able to hopefully um, get some detail as well. And you can see going into the bedrooms, um, lovely view out the windows, things like that. So I really encourage you to just kind of tour around in these stories. It's, it's really interesting and it's, and it's just strikes me all these different experiences. Um, really, really great to read. Um, there's also an artifacts page and here we've created, um, we, we've taken images from the museum and they're little hot spots. You can, you can hover over things to see. Um, close-up pictures of some of the artifacts. And, um, and then you can also see, we, we've pulled in some quotes from some of the hosts as to what their favorite artifacts were around the museum. And so we, we go through the pantry, we go through the bedroom, we go through the parlor. And then at also uh, one other thing I wanna point out is um, it's, very, it's very early on, but um, Josh and Laura will be adding to the blog um, as things come up. And this is a way for there to be some, um, some current news on the, the Life Upstairs blog. So we'll see where that goes. And I also encourage you to just, um, if, if, you, if you're interested, if you have any questions, comments, you'd like to add a story, um, please click on the feedback link and um, send a message over and, um, and we'll... Uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to do anything with it, but Josh and Laura will hopefully. So, and then, and then of course, we want to encourage visitors and this links back to the Grable website. So that in a nutshell is the website and I hope um, that you enjoy it. And I also hope that it is uh, up for 
uh, quite some time to serve as a as a lovely reminder of and 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 kind of uh, uh, something to point to. Um, but when you're talking with people, um, you hosts who are in on the call, and you're talking with people, and you say, "Yeah, I used to live in a museum. Hey, check it out." <laughs> so nice to be able to offer that. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, I think we're all looking forward to spending some more time after the event tonight exploring the exhibit more in depth. So again, for folks, um, you can find it at lifeupstairs.ca. And I'll remind you of that link at the end of the presentation as well. Um, as Chris showed you, the first thing that you might click when you visit the exhibit is People, which shows you the timeline of Brubaker House hosts from 1977 to the present. There have been 11 couples or 22 hosts in total. Initially, as they said, um, the Brubaker House Committee selected retired couples to fill the role as hosts, um, but then began hiring younger applicants. Uh, and tonight, for the first time, many of these people are coming together to share our stories and connect our common experiences of living and working in this unique place. Because our time together is limited, um, I'll ask each couple to share for just a few minutes. And then if there's extra time at the end, um, we can, people can add more stories if they wish. Um, but after, after each host couple sh does some storytelling, uh, there will be an opportunity for an audience Q&A so if you think of questions or comments while the hosts are sharing, uh, please feel free to type them into the chat at any time. And then the hosts can later respond to as many questions as we have time for. I'll call on the hosts in chronological order of when they served at Brubaker House. And if any of them or their family members happen to not be present this <coughs> evening, um, Josh and I will jump in to share a story or two that they contributed to the exhibit. Um, so let's get started. So our first hosts um, were in the museum from 1977 to 82, and uh, that's Nancy and Ted Maitland. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone from their family or Nancy and Ted are here. Uh, I'm here, but how can I... Uh, be on the camera? I'm here. Okay. You're there. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> okay. Uh, hello. Um, I probably am the only non-Mennonite who was ever a host at the Brubaker House. Um, whether that's a claim to fame or not, I don't know. But uh, uh, I came to, um, I worked in the library at Conrad Grable from grade nine till uh, I finished third year university at Laurier. And uh, after that, I studied for a master's degree in museology. So through my connection with Conrad Grable, um, I knew they would be opening a museum and uh, spoke to them quite often about uh, working there. And um, it didn't work out as any of us had planned due to some funding issues, but I continued to live there and was very grateful to have uh, the experience and the accommodation. Um, I worked at my old job in the library for a while and um, then I worked at the University of Waterloo Archives, and then I worked at the uh, Archives at Mutual Life, which became uh, Clerica and Sun Life, and I'm now retired. And I'm working uh, part-time for the Wellesley Township Heritage and Historical Society. I'm the uh, curator of their small collection and historical room in Wellesley. Um, some friends of mine, I have very fond memories of, of living there. Some friends of mine lived in the little house next door. I don't even know if that house is still there, but we certainly had some uh, lovely um, quiet evenings and get togethers. There was a golf course out the back. I don't think that's there anymore. And uh, so there were always people around um, golfing. And then uh, somehow it got to be a hangout for people with remote control airplanes. And that noise got to be extremely annoying. <laughs> And, um, but by and large, it was, I had my first garden and I uh, remained a, a gardener to this day. And so I, I enjoyed that part of, of, of living there as well. Um, during my work at Mutual Life, I happened to um, talk to one of the maintenance men uh, there. And he said that he and his, his family as a child, he as a child lived there. I think he said in the fifties. 
and they just rented the house. And uh, he said in the winter, it was so impassable that they had to park out on Albert Street and walk in to, to get there because uh, there was no road or any way they could get there in the winter. Um, there were a couple of things. Um, No, I think um, after, um, so partway through um, my living there, I, I got married and, and uh, uh, before that we had not been able to, I had not been able to use that second bedroom upstairs. And so after Ted and I got married, then we were allowed to use that extra room. It was very, very cold. It was very, very cold room. <laughs> and we really just stored his stuff there um, and lived in the main part of the house. Um, we had many, many lovely family uh, parties uh, there, and uh, um, it was a, it was a great great time uh, in my life. So I think that's about all. Oh, there was one funny thing. I I did mention a couple things in what I submitted, but there was one that we got our mail at the college, and so uh, the. Um, post office must have been very surprised because we were when we got a letter addressed to uh, Comrade Grable Cottage. And so uh, it was sort of a real um, mis misnomer of the, <laughs> of the address, but uh, that was just a little funny thing. I think that's all. Okay. That's wonderful, Nancy. Thank you so much. And I loved hearing, I mean, just noticing some of the changes since you were there, like the golf course that you mentioned yeah. now is a disc golf course, which is very popular. And um, the remote control airplanes that were zooming around your house uh, are now drones. So it's, yeah, different world. <laughs> but mm -hmm. the second bedroom is still very cold. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Or bad. bad. <laughs> so thanks so much, Nancy. Um, we'll pass it over now. Uh, well, actually, I'll say next. Um, the next hosts after Nancy and Ted were Ida Habermill and Dorothy Bean, um, who are now deceased. Um, Ida passed away in 1989, and Dorothy in 1994. So I don't know if there's anyone here this evening who is wanting to speak on their behalf. If so, um, please unmute yourself and you can you can begin speaking. Well, if not, um, I'll just share a little bit about Ida and Dorothy. Uh, they began their retirement as the first live in custodian hostesses of Brubaker House. And in a letter from Brubaker House committee member, Lorna Berge, these two women were asked whether they were planning to retire immediately into rocking chairs with their knitting, or could they be interested in becoming involved with an interesting project for the next few years? In a letter, Dorothy and Ida stated, we have an active interest in our roots and in the preservation of Mennonite history. Our memories go back to grandparents who lived in the 19th century building homes, rearing families in that century and giving us a goodly heritage. To be involved in meeting individuals who are interested in this era and interpreting this life to tourists is exciting and a real challenge for us. Um, so just to share a, one of the stories, well, an entry, I guess, from a diary. Let me scroll up a sec. Um, so uh, there, as Chris mentioned, there's a whole section on the, in the exhibit about kind of mishaps and pe different pests that people have experienced while living at the house. Um, Dorothy Bean had several entries in her daily diary about the water and weather problems at Brubaker House specifically. So I'll just read some of those off. Um, she wrote, December 6th, 1982, water in basement. December 20, 21st, 1982, I fell on my butt while getting the mail. December 27th, vacuumed 15 pails of water from the basement floor. December 28th, picked up 13 pails of water in basement. March 7th, 1983, car snowed in, so took the bus to church. November 28th, windy, hydro off for 45 minutes. February 25th, 1985, UW men came to clean up water in basement. Ida made a fire to dry out the brick floor. 
April 8th, 1985, telephone got fixed. It had been hit by lightning. UW men came and uh, to mop up water. And finally, June 29th, 1986, fed geese and walked around golf course. Rain and hailstorm came up and blew the door shut and all were locked out in the storm. So I think probably all the hosts and hearing um, those entries from her diary will relate to many of her experiences. I know that we've had many similar experiences and you'll, you'll read about more on the exhibit website. Um, but that's a little bit from Ida and Dorothy. Um, next, we had um, Paul and Edna Huntsberger, who were hosts from 1986 to 1991. And again, um, they're both deceased now, Paul in 2016 and Edna in 2019. Um, and here's the photo of them. Um, Paul and Edna, well, I don't know, first of all, if there's anyone here this evening who wanted to speak on their behalf. Well, I'm their son, uh, Ray Hunsberger. Uh, I can understand why the university has gone to younger people. Because I remember them carrying groceries and suitcases up those long stairs. And I was always concerned they wouldn't make it to the top. So <laughs> probably need younger people. But also remember the, the amount of enjoyment the, they got by sitting on the porch, watching them play soccer and different sports on the field outside the the house. Um, our son enjoyed going up there in the summertime and going with dad, walking around the golf course, finding golf balls. So there's, yeah, a lot of memories of uh, how they interacted with their grandkids and helping them enjoy the house also. That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing. Um, there's still uh, still a lot of um, not so much golf balls around, though there is one or two people who come um, maybe once a month to, to hit balls off over the um, Frisbee golf course. Um, just, I, I think they're still used to it being a golf course. Um, they've been doing it for years, probably. Um, but there's a new base. The baseball diamond's been moved over the last two years. So now it's right below the house on the lower fields. Um, oh. so we get a lot of baseballs. Um, that our son Oren finds in the, mm -hmm. the garden or just around. <laughs> and cricket bats too. Um, lots of cricket playing on the baseball diamond as well. My, my name is Gay Lehman and I would be a daughter of Paul Ned Hunsberger. And I remember visiting them many times at the Boo Baker house. Mom always loved the big deep window sills upstairs because she loved plants. And so she had a great place to display her plants. They loved being hosts and hostess there. They, they just thrived on it. Dad had all kinds of PowerPoint, or I guess they were PowerPoint shows, but he had information in the, in the basement and mom would give tours on the main floor then. So it was always a highlight to go visit them. Thanks so much. Anyone else um, speaking about about the Huntsburgers. Okay. So next up is uh, Howard and Carol Gimble. Um, and they were here from 1991 to 1994. And uh, um, they're both deceased uh, now. Carol passed away in 2014 and Howard just uh, in 2020. Um, and we're told he would have loved to participate in this project. Is there anyone on the call um, that would like to talk about some of their experiences? All right, um, so we'll just tell me to talk about the photo here. Um, the photo above shows Howard and Carol at the Brubaker House display for Heritage Week in 1991 at Conestoga Mall. So um, we've never been to a Heritage Week, but I, I guess that used to happen uh, frequently. Um, so that's them there in the photo. Um, and we don't have too many stories from them, but the exhibit does feature some photos, really nice photos of their garden and a 1992 New Year's Eve party with friends. Um, one of the interesting photos that the exhibit uh, features is uh, a striking photo of a football fields being constructed 
which you look at it, you wouldn't know if you go to the North Campus today, that this is even anywhere near where we are now. Um, hmm. So it's changed quite a bit. So um, after the gimbals, we had Arlen and Judith Friesen Epp, who were hosts from 1994 to 2000. And Arlen and Judith, I believe you're here this evening. So over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much for for this evening. This is this is this is wonderful to, to also meet um, the folks that followed us as well. Um, it felt like the gimbals had kind of give, given us the keys to the house. Um, when we started, we had a bit of a relationship with them initially. Um, they showed us around and uh, um, enjoyed their company. We also were privileged as, as these new young 20-somethings um, who uh, weren't of Pennsylvania German background, Mennonite background, or were not Swiss Mennonite, uh, were not from Waterloo County. Um, and just felt very privileged to be invited into the role. Um, we were well introduced by, or mentored by uh, Lorraine Roth and uh, Lorna Berge, who were on our historical committee and our Brubaker House committee, um, and uh, uh, toured us around Waterloo County, had introduced us to a number of things, told us stories, um, and uh, really, embraced us um, as we were kind of um, felt like a bit of outsiders uh, initially, but uh, very welcomed into the role and it really became home to us and to our family. Um, yeah, I think one of the highlights for us there was that we had our oldest two children were born in the house. Uh, they were home births up in the apartment. And uh, so it felt like, if I remember correctly, I think the Brubaker children were born there as well, right, uh, in the house. So it felt like we were continuing a tradition there. Um, so uh, when, the, when our oldest Allegra was born there in uh, 1996, the midwives were there, it was a night birth and there was a wild thunderstorm going out. And I just remember them sitting at the kitchen table, drinking red rose tea talk while I was in major pain, talking about how romantic this birth was. <laughs> so um, it was, yeah, it was a fun place to have our kids go home. And two of the trees on the yard of Brubaker House are birth trees for our children. So there's a ginkgo tree and a, a Japanese lilac tree, a Japanese ivory lilac, I think, that uh, symbolized the birth of our two kids. I think they're still there. We would be surprised sometimes by who showed up for tours, um, including um, Brubaker descendants or others that had rented the home earlier in the 50s and or had lived in the home at, as, as children and uh, their presence in the in the house um, were those were always very um, engaging and fond conversations that we really enjoyed. I think we always had a good laugh when someone would ring the doorbell of Brubaker house and say where can we go to find a Mennonite? And uh, our favorite response was, ta-da! <laughs> uh, that was always an interesting, uh, interesting conversation after that. Um, yeah, we, we were there while we were students uh, at uh, University of Waterloo and also Wilfrid Laurier. So it was a great place to uh, live while we were finishing our studies. Um, and I guess uh, after that, we uh, went, uh, when we left Brubaker House, we went with Mennonite Central Committee to serve in New Orleans, Louisiana. And uh, what else? Uh, yeah, in summers, I actually worked at Conrad Grable with Paul Penner and also with Sam Steiner, both of whom are here tonight, I think. So it was a great, good uh, gig over the summers. Yeah, and I had worked with Mennonite, uh, Mennonite Church Eastern Canada at the time for, for a number of, number of times. Yeah, so right now I'm a pastor at Home Street Mennonite Church here in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and Arlen is- uh, I, work, I work at Common Word, which is a bookstore and resource center in Mennonite Church Canada in CMU. There you go, I think that's us. Thank you so much. Um, next we have Colin and Jenny Weeb who were hosts from 2000 to 2004. We also are not of Swiss Mennonite descent. And I remember Paul Penner uh, when we were, I don't know, interviewing? Paul Penner 
made the specific stipulation. He said, I know you're Russian Mennonite, but can you please still tell the Swiss Mennonite story? Are you okay to do that? And so that was a little, um, a little joke. I was also doing history. One of my jobs was in the summer I was at Dune, whatever it's called now, Dune Heritage Crossroads, the Waterloo Region Museum, Dune Pioneer Village. I don't know, it's had many names. That one was set in 1914 and the Brubaker House was set in 1850. And so I confess to sometimes mixing things up when I was giving tours in various places because sometimes I would forget where I was. It was a convenient place for us to be during a time when I was doing my master's. I studied engineering, I'm now doing engineering. Um, I wanted to show you Ardith or our. Arlen and Judith, I still have one of the cuttings from one of the plants still growing. This would have been something that you left behind when you guys moved. Uh, so that's kind of fun. Um, we don't have the deep window sills here, but. Um, we lived there while the construction started. So when we moved in, there was a lovely golf course and beautiful fields. And then for two summers, we lived with um, earth movers and the dishes in the kitchen shaking and a lot of dust. But it did provide, um, one of our favorite things was my two brothers lived in town at the time. And my youngest brother was really into rockets. And so he would buy little rocket engines. And the fact that everything was leveled and there was nothing there meant that we could launch these rockets off of the infrastructure pads that had been put in and you wouldn't lose them because there was nowhere for them to hide. And so we had um, a few family events where we would decorate and create rockets in the basement, and then we would launch them outside. Not very 1850 um, time appropriate. <laughs> Do you have anything else? Uh, I guess I can confess to stealing something from Brubaker House. So I found these old records that were there. Reader's Digest records from 1982. And they were in the chest or the, the hutch down below. In the so kitchen. Somebody had been using them for entertainment. I think it might have been the Huntsberger family. So I apologize. If you want these back, Ray, I can give them back to you. <laughs> I didn't think they were appropriate for the time. Uh, I'll pass. <laughs> I think that's all for us, Laura. Thanks so much, Jenny and Colin. Um, so next up we have uh, Chris Steingart and Jillian Burkhart, who, who served from 2004 to six. Hi everybody. So when we moved in, um, we had just gotten married and I was a TA at Rockway Mennonite Collegiate our first year and then- No, you were in teacher's college. No, and then my second year oh, that we were there, I was in teacher's college. So it worked out really well that I was off for the summers and Chris was a youth pastor at WK United Mennonite Church in Waterloo. So that worked really well just for flexible schedules. Um, and then after that, we- uh, Paul, Paul tinkered with having a Russian Mennonite and a Swiss Mennonite. That's right, another just Russian- Just to see yeah. how it would go. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so after our two years there, we went um, to teach English in South Korea. And then coming back, I um, started teaching with the Waterloo Board, um, doing elementary teaching. And that's when Chris started uh, doing web design and uh, graphic design back here. And we're in, we're in Kitchener currently. Um, but yeah, a lot of, lot of great memories because uh, it was our first home that we lived in together. We, um, we had our wedding photos taken at Brubaker House. So that was a really nice memory that we have. Um, and yeah, we, we also experienced a lot of different rodents. We've ch we chased out a number of chipmunks. I remember there being tons of ladybugs in the windowsills often. Um, and for me, one of my memories uh, silly memories is I'm used to living in, in the city and having neighbors. And so living at the Brubaker house, it felt like we were in the country because there was so much open space around us. And it was dark. It was and, dark. Yeah. And it was dark. And so, um, I have a very active imagination. So I always found it very 
uh, very scary at nighttime having to drive into the drive into the uh, the parking lot, which was like a ways away from the house. And I just always remember sprinting from the parking lot up to the back porch. And then it was always, I always found a little scared going through the dark museum, running up to, up to our apartment. Um, but anyways, I don't know, maybe other people have active imaginations come, like me, but I just remember those were some tough times. That, and, uh, I would, and I would come home <laughs> at night and every door upstairs was shut. <laughs> yes. I'd be like, how are you doing? How's it going? I felt safe once I was up in that apartment, but uh, yes. Yeah. But overall, loved, loved our time there. Just little silly things like that, you know, active imaginations. And we, um, when we moved in, we were, I guess we were the first host with no golf course. So hearing all these stories about golf course, I think I would have loved that. Just like head out for an easy nine in the morning. Um, and we were also, um, so at the time that I was living at Brubaker House, I was um, working at a church and started um, putting together websites and doing that sort of thing. So that was kind of when my future career was launched. And um, it was also around that time uh, we inherited the dial up internet connection there, uh, which was free, but we shelled out the cash to get uh, high speed DSL. And uh, that felt like a real improvement. Um, and seeing the picture of uh, the gimbals um, projector, Jenny and Colin and Arlen, Judith, you'd remember that, but we only had, the, I, I said, I think we ran it like four times because at that time we created a new, um, a DVD, um, which was filmed a live action uh, historical depiction, which I, which I understand is still there today. So um, did you talk about big window sills? Love the big window sills. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. As we started, we started before, a lot of so plants, yep. had a lot of, um, it was really fun having gatherings, friends gatherings. One of my favorite things was being in the summer kitchen in January, getting a roaring fire and with rabbit ears, getting CTV on a, on a small TV and watching NFL football playoffs on a Sunday afternoon. It was just like the open hearth blazing. It was, it was awesome. And you'd hear people tobogganing outside and you'd be like, you, you guys are freezing your butts off and we're enjoying the lovely warm fire. That's, that's great. Thanks so much, Chris and Jillian. Um, next we have Brandon and Bethany Lease who served from 2006 to nine. Hi, we, yes, we were there when, while we were there, I was working at the Grable Library as well. I feel like that's a, a theme with some of the hosts <laughs> that have spoken. Um, and I started doing my master's in library and information science at Western Ontario. And so I was commuting a lot um, for that. And then I started working at the Library Services Center and, and Brennan was busy as well. Uh, yeah, when I was at the Brubaker house and, and Colin bringing out the records made me run into our other room and get this thing that I also have from the Brubaker house. I'm not sure what it was, but it was holding screws. So some of these screws might be yours, but they're also some of mine. And so I thought maybe confessional time that made it to our house <laughs> after. Hopefully we didn't take many of the stones with us, Josh and Laura, I think the foundation's still okay. Um, but yeah, I was... Uh, a musician, I should say we applied the same time Chris and Jillian did, the same time they did, because uh, I'd known Colin and Jenny went to school with Jenny's brother, Steve, and it was not part of any of those rocket launchings, just for the record, because I know this is being recorded. Um, but we did not get chosen. Chris and Jillian did, because I, I think it was because we were not married. And they didn't want to have the cloud of a couple <laughs> living in sin hanging over them. So good, good decision there. But and so we cried for two years and then and then got the call to come in. Um, but so I was working as a musician, teaching some music uh, at different colleges, doing some conducting uh, and performing. Uh, and now I still do some of that now uh, more full time and also working at a, at a local church, not unlike Chris, working at Sterling Avenue Mennonite Church, where I still live now. So it was great to have a, a, a gig working uh, at the museum, living there, 
uh, that you could fit in all these different pieces into what, what otherwise is, is a gig light for a, a musician, a working musician as well. Um, some stories uh, that, that we remember, um, at least that I remember, I mean, Nancy twigged a few uh, about, you know, it's weird having to fill out a form with your address. You couldn't fit Brubaker House Museum, University of Waterloo Campus, 200 Columbia Street on a thing. So it was like B slash H Museum. And I remember getting a letter from my grandmother uh, and um, our postal code, I mean, they did really good work at the University of Waterloo. They're smart, clearly. Uh, our postal code was like N2E3855. She had confused our address, our postal code with the end of our <laughs> telephone number, and it still made it to us. I don't know how that was possible, uh, but it was. So you had to rely on all the different folks around the campus. You didn't know who to call. Uh, while living there, we had a crack in the firebox of the furnace. So I was uh, gone. Uh, came back and and the firebox had turned on for the the fall and soot oily soot got on everything and so literally every item artifact from the museum every bit of our personal um, clothing books every single book hockey equipment had to go out and be professionally cleaned and brought back in so that was chaotic uh, and then the next year uh, they decided a renovation project was a good idea so they tore off the whole porch which i've heard they've done again tore out all the windows so it took a number of months you know things are always going awry as people talk about we had paul penner's number like in in big you know, I think Paul Penner should say how many calls he got from from people, us included of, okay, Paul, no power. Okay, Paul, this, and, and you know, and then he has to try to find somebody at all hours of the night to try to um, help out with lots of um, chaotic situations. So Paul, lots of, lots of stuff he did there. Um, for me, I think the most fetching, um, uh, the thing that drew me to, to the position in the first place and, and the lasting memories are the different people we met. Uh, so we had a lot of the similar experiences, but I think some of the people were unique, although, you know, uh, there was a gentleman named Dennis who would come every Wednesday to golf, even though it had been, as we heard, years since the golf course existed. Every Wednesday, Dennis would come at 1135 and start golfing. There was no golf course there, but he was going to be golfing, and he did for about an hour every Wednesday, so that was Dennis. Um, there'd also be people that would rush into the parking lot. Two vehicles would come in at noon. Those people would end up in one vehicle for a little bit, and then two vehicles would rush away again. And you wondered that story. I didn't. I never asked, but it was always a bit of a panicked uh, attack. So we met some interesting people. There were often some injured sledders that we'd come and bandage up. Our first aid kit was often used more for others uh, than, than ourselves. Um, but uh, another connection with, with people, our, one of our last tours that we gave uh, ended up being to our now neighbor. We live in Kitchener and I, I was meeting our new neighbors when we moved into our house. We just moved out of Brubaker House and a lady came around the corner of her house saying, I know that voice. And she had just been with her daughter and her daughter's friend to the museum. So it was a neat, uh, neat connection point there um, to connect in with one of our new neighbors. So lots more stories about connecting with people and the meaning making there and that, that continues to this day. Anything else add? Thanks. Thanks. That's wonderful. Thanks, Brandon and Bethany. Um, next up, we have Allison and Mark Brubaker, who served from 2009 to 13. And I'm not actually sure if either of them are here this evening. Okay, well, I'll just share a little bit about them. Um, Allison and Mark met working in costume at a history museum. Um, and they both finished their history degrees while they dated each other. So it felt like a natural fit for them uh, to live at Brubaker House. Uh, one of the memories that they shared in the exhibit was of hosting some parties um, in front of the open hearth fire, as Chris mentioned, in the basement, um, including a costumed uh, murder mystery party on New Year's Eve. And they also shared another uh, maybe spooky memory. Uh, we are still certain that the grandfather clock bonged twice one night when it was completely broken and not working. It was creepy. So that's uh, Mark and Allison. Um, after their term here um, came Jackie and Carl Reimer um, who lived here from 2013 to 2017. Cool. Hi, um, I'm Jackie. This is Carl. Um, 
So as was sort of mentioned already, while living at Brewbaker House, I um, became a photographer. We moved to Brewbaker House, like Carl actually, we applied to live at Brewbaker House while Carl was finishing his undergrad. And I was, uh, I don't know, maybe 12 months out. Um, and I had no idea what I wanted to do, <laughs> um, but I had, we had just gotten married and I bought a camera to fill my time with some sort of hobby. And then we ended up at Brubaker House, which uh, honestly is a phenomenal place to think about photography. It's beautiful, it's bright. Uh, I mean, it, yeah. <laughs> so basically uh, Brubaker House was my first like after school job. Um, then I got into photography. I had a stint at Mennonite Savings and Credit Union while shooting, shooting weddings and working at Brubaker House. Uh, but by the time we left Brubaker House, I was a full-time photographer. Um, and that's what I am still doing. Yeah, and I am worked at, uh, I started working at Mennonite Central Committee as the IT coordinator when we lived there, and uh, that's what I'm still <laughs> doing. Um, really quick, the stories of running up the stairs in the dark, I definitely relate to that, especially the first few nights we were there. It was terrifying going <laughs> up to that apartment. Um, and uh, as far as runs go, I think our favorite one was a groundhog that went under the floor and pushed up the bricks in the bottom in the basement and came inside. That was an adventure. Um, but also uh, we had an adventure where it was late at night and we started smelling what we thought was a skunk. And then it, the smell got stronger and stronger. And, and suddenly we we're like worried that there was some sort of gas leak or something going on. And we had guests over at the time. It was, it was actually quite late. And everyone was like, yeah, this is sound, this smells disturbing. So we all, we all left the house Anyway, long story short, it, it was a skunk. It somehow the skunk had had gotten wherever it sprayed. It got into our furnace vents, and the vents were just pumping skunk smell all over the house. Um, we got somebody from campus. So again, we I don't know how everyone thought it was a gas leak, but we all did. We're like, yeah, this is this can't be skunk. It's too too potent, too pungent. Anyway, so yeah, we had somebody from campus come and, and take a look around and kind of to our embarrassment it was like okay yes it is just just a skunk in any case it was too late for us to go anywhere else we had to spend the night there and if you laid perfectly still it was fine but as soon as you would like move your head or anything you, your your smell sensors would pick it up again skunk anyway we had to spend a few nights at a laundromat just washing all our clothes but that being said i feel very one-upped by uh brand bethany's like like furnace oil suit <laughs> I would rather have a skunk. So you know what? Now I'm feeling a little better about that about that whole thing. Um, as miserable as we were, it sounds better than furnace oil soot. Oh, that yeah. <laughs> um, another story is that every year we lived there, we uh, we had a very gentle um, Easter egg hunt in the museum with our family. Very gentle. <laughs> um, this is being recorded. <laughs> this is being recorded. Um, and it was, I think, six adults and one child. Um, but, you know, I was very invested anyway. Um, so like, I don't know, like maybe four or five months past Easter, one day I'm giving a tour, you know, in the zone, sharing stories, keeping information on point. Um, and the person I'm giving a tour to like very genuinely reaches out onto a shelf and pulls up this small egg and just asked me to explain this artifact. Um, it's just, it's actually just a chocolate Easter egg that we missed during the hunt. Uh, so Carl and I kept it because that was just too, that, that person was so kind and so genuine, but I, I just had to explain that. It was an opportunity to bring up the fact that, you know, I live in the house. I had an Easter egg hunt here. Obviously we missed one. That's all that is and go back to the tour. Um, anyway. <laughs> Um, and actually, okay, one last, we were going to mention this, but then Colin mentioned stealing, I mean, uh, <laughs> permanent borrowing, and then Brandon as well. And ours actually relates to Colin, I believe. Um, I don't want this to be fake news, but I believe this is a true story. Um, well, we've lived at a bigger house in the basement. There was a, a, there's some kind of cabinet on it. It was just like a few things that didn't really seem like artifacts. They were just like, oh, like, honestly kind of junk just like left behind and when we were moving out and cleaning up I just like looked at one of those objects and I was like I'm going to take that with me because I know it's not an artifact and I don't know what it is but I think it looks like modern like a modern home design element and I would like that 
Um, I know Jenny Lieb from like the photography community. And one time she came over to our house and she looked on a shelf and she said, I know what that is. So we took this from Brubaker House, which honestly does sort of look like, I don't know. Anyway, I just really thought it was something interesting. Um, apparently Colin made this as in his engineering school. <laughs> yeah, that was a project, a great a fourth year project. Oh, you can, you have, can have it. Back. <laughs> no, I don't want it. <laughs> anyway, it's been on our bookshelf for five years because I think it looks cool. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> I guess I didn't do a very good job of collecting all our Easter eggs either. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, we took one of those as well, but then Bethany <laughs> made me throw it out a few years ago. Ours was better, and it was a structural arm, you told me. Structural arm. Oh my goodness, that is too funny. <laughs> well, thanks so much, um, Jackie and Carl. And that brings us up to the present now um, with Joshua and I as current hosts. Um, so actually, like Chris, uh, when we first moved in here, I worked at Waterloo Kitchener United Mennonite Church as um, as a musician, and I'm also a community musician, but currently at home with our two-year-old son, Oren. And uh, I teach with the public board right now. Um, I teach high school math and science. And right now I'm actually teaching out in Elmira at EDSS. So because we still live here, um, we have lots of stories fresh in our memories, but we'll just share a couple. Uh, we have tons of animal stories, um, but I think the one I wanted to share, because I, I haven't heard too many people talk about uh, snakes yet. Um, it was just last winter, I believe, there was a thaw and uh, a snake was probably hibernating in the wall in the basement, came out and, and made its way into the house um, mid through the winter. And it was kind of, I almost stepped on it actually. I brought Orin downstairs to, to walk around and um, there was a snake, um, a little, well, it wasn't too little. It was like, uh, I don't know, a couple feet long maybe, but um, it was a good sized garter snake. And uh, we named it Johnny. And uh, actually we kept it for a short time in a box and then uh, gave it to a friend of mine who works with the board um, as an outdoor educator. So it had, had a long life after it left the Brubaker house. So that was kind of a fun experience, but we've had all sorts of animals um, around the house and people have mentioned a lot of them. Another one that happened uh, maybe last year, was it? There was a bat that came down the chimney um, and then flew up from the basement all the way up to the apartment um, and was doing laps around the, the apartment while um, Laura was kind of hiding Orin in the back room and I had a box and I was trying to chase it back down. So eventually we got it out through the front door, um, which was a bit of an adventure, but we all survived. <laughs> um, another story that I just wanted to mention because I forgot to submit it to the exhibit, um, but it involves an annual race that takes place on North Campus. So like most things that happen around the house, we don't know they're happening until they're happening. Um, the organizers don't usually realize that anyone lives here and should be informed before their only road out of the RNT park gets closed for the day. So it happened that we woke up one Sunday morning and looked out the window and there were orange cones and event te tents set up everywhere. Um, volunteers in matching t-shirts, yelling into microphones, uh, runners in their gear and police officers milling about and we realized that race day was about to begin. Of course, I was running late for church um, where I was supposed to be directing a choir rehearsal and leading worship that morning. And we had no way to get there um, because our road was closed. So by the, time, by the time we got to the car and wove our way down Frank Tompa Drive through the maze of cones and explained our situation to the officers on duty, there was nothing to be done. The race was in progress. Runners were zooming around the roundabout as fast as they could go, and no officer was about to intervene on behalf of a desperate church musician to pause the race so that I could get to work. You were leading worship that morning. Yeah, <laughs> so by some miracle, a gap emerged in the running pack, and the officers finally agreed to quickly let us pass through. And so we somehow made it to the church on time, but uh, for a few minutes there, it was looking, looking like I would be arriving by bike during the benediction. So, 
Um, yeah, so that's that's it from us. And um, that kind of wraps up the storytelling portion of our event tonight. Um, we are running a bit over um, an hour, but I hope that you'll stay tuned for the Q&A um, if you're able to. Um, I am just gonna check to see um, if you haven't already, feel free right now to type any questions into the chat um, for our hosts and hosts feel free to ask questions of each other as well. Um, we'll just uh, do a few minutes of Q&A and then that'll be followed by kind of an informal time when people can just um, chat and maybe ask any questions you didn't have an opportunity to. So um, let's see here. Most memorable visitors. Um, is that a question for a specific host couple or just in general? And Marlena says, great to see all the folks who hosted my Mennonite history classes year after year. I think Justin Trudeau made it here recently. Um, not when we were here though. Oh yeah, that was Trudeau came when uh, we were hosts. He needed a place to change, so we offered our bedroom, and he said no. And then uh, we we went we met outside the house. Uh, we actually were with uh, Bart Jagger, who was we, she just like kept us close while he was giving a, an election, like very. I'm going to use the word aggressive, a very like focused speech. And then as he started to walk away, Bart said, "Oh, like there's people here," and his. <laughs> He just became a politician. It was very friendly <laughs> and uh, took a, a photo uh, with my camera, which through a long process of me trying to tell them they we should we should use a camera and it just be one of us in the photo with Justin Trudeau because they wouldn't know how to use my camera. And yet you can see the photo in the exhibit. It's the blurry one where you can't see what's happening. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Any other um, memorable visitors that people want to share about? Uh, one that always comes to mind, I don't know why it sticks in my mind, but uh, we had a visitor um, come through the museum and uh, I was giving her a tour and she pointed out the grandfather clock and then she, her um, husband, her late husband at that time, I guess, had uh, run a shop I think it was in St. Jacob's I don't know but that was where the grandfather clock got serviced um, and that's always kind of one of the, the stories that just weird connections so she kind of really bonded to the experience of the tour because it reminded her of her, her cousin who had passed away um, and I learned a little bit more about the grandfather clock and that it had been serviced within the last little while and she explained a little bit more um, about it and its history that wasn't on the on the panel there. Um, I just wanted to comment too that um, the connection that we share with Arlen and Judith, um, because yeah, in December 2019, our son was born at the house too, um, in a home birth with St. Jacob's midwives. And when I registered with them, they said, oh, your address is already on file. And so um, I looked into it and yeah, we, we found an article about um, your children being born here and then also later learned um, about the trees that you planted for them. And we've actually continued in that tradition as well. And we planted, I think it was a white spruce tree or Christmas tree that we had last year. Um, we planted it down by the lake um, for Oren. And I think that some other couples have also planted trees. I know Jackie and Carl did for sure. Um, I think on the island in Columbia Lake um, and maybe others as well, but that's kind of a really neat tradition that's continued. Um, that is so cool. Yeah, that is great. Uh, strangest question asked by a guest. Guest. It's one of the questions that uh, Marlene put out there. Um, I don't have one that comes to mind immediately. Strangest question. Um, I guess the typical one is, do you have electricity in the internet upstairs? Um, but or do you have a cell phone? Yeah, that's that's which one. usually we've just finished explaining to people um, how you know modern Mennonites live with all these 
uh, new technologies, like in contrast to the brew bakers. But then actually Josh and I don't have cell phones. So then they're just really confused. Um, Arlen, I think it was Arlen and Judith or Jenny and Colin, their thing, uh, somebody had asked, does the UW president live here? He came for a banquet. I think they had some picnic. I don't. I don't yeah, remember. it was David Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. And and I actually had an exam that day, not to make it all about me, but they they were hosting this meal, and I had like this meal of fancy goat and other meats and stuff, and I washed it down with the beer because they were giving me all this stuff, and then I went and wrote my exam. It was the best exam ever. <laughs> well. Paul, Paul just said he had to go, but I remember always talking with Paul about like, like when we talk about the repairs and things like that, and when is it going to happen, blah, blah, blah. And David Johnson was the president and it, the comment was always, I think Paul always said, oh yeah, David loves the Mennonites. So, so we're going to get this, this house is going to get taken care of. He loves Mennonite culture. I wanted to actually, Brandon, and Bethany, if you could talk uh, just for a minute. I know that um, we've shared a lot of conversations about the house and you had shared that there was a time when Brubaker House, like there was a possibility that it was gonna be converted into just an office building for the university. Um, and, th and there was some fear around that. Do you wanna talk about that a bit? Sure, our two-year-old Ezra is coming in to share his thoughts on the matter. And I see Marlene is here. Mar Marlene, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It was an interesting time. Um, I always mention to people that, you know, the big chimney that's in the middle of campus, It's if you've seen the Lord of the Rings films, it's like the Eye of Sauron. And all of a sudden, it kind of turned and the gaze came upon Brubaker House. And uh, the Dean of Arts, who shall remain nameless, uh, at the time came in to tour it because uh, they were looking to repurpose it. It's a university building and, you know, if it can't uh, uh, drum up some, some sense of uh, meaning, which I think was lower on the list than income, revenue, all these other things, then, then maybe it should be repurposed. Uh, and that was looked at quite seriously until there was a, a political scandal that David Johnson was actually asked to um, go to Ottawa and form terms of how this would be assessed and all of a sudden then then it kind of shifted you know, gently off of the agenda thankfully maybe Marlene you were pulling strings off the back end of that I'm not sure but it was certainly an interesting time and and you know some of the the hosts after us may not have had such a, a friendly place to live or at least there might have been shared accommodations with uh, those um, grading exams and coming up with arts policies so it was, it was certainly an interesting time. Well, I, I would just say we mounted a good campaign to oppose the encroachment of the university bureaucracy into Brubaker House and uh, successfully demonstrated that this was, uh, um, this was an icon, uh, uh, like a, an important, valuable place on campus. And we, we, we turned back the bureaucracy, so it was good. Well, maybe one last question that I see in the chat from uh, Ginny Hostetler, the Canadian Mennonite editor, just wondering if there were common questions that hosts um, heard from visitors over the years. I was asked a lot why I wasn't dressed in costume. And I, that, I think they're expecting the experience when you go to Joseph Schneider House and Dune Heritage where people are dressed according to the time period, but I I would run downstairs from doing whatever I was doing upstairs to, to give a tour. And sometimes I forgot my shoes. So that would really throw people off that I didn't have my shoes on. So they would kind of look down and you're, you're not dressed appropriately. <laughs> I, would, I would apologize and say, I'm sorry, I, but I live here. And then that would start the whole, the whole conversation of living upstairs. Needless to say, for clothing reasons and otherwise, I did most of the tours. <laughs> uh, but another um, thing we were often asked is family members. And in fact, Bethany's father's father's mother's mother's father, again, father's father's mother's mother's father was the second eldest son of John E. Brubaker. And we also had uh, Dorothy Elliott, one of the um, granddaughters, I think, who lived in the house when it was still a house, come and visit uh, during our time there. So 
it was asked about family members. Are there still family members around? And certainly we have long, uh, relatives come and visit us. Uh, and so it was great when they could. Um, and also, yeah, the garb. Why aren't you dressed in the way you would have, would have dressed? <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you so much to all of you for joining us tonight and for your great questions. Um, thanks to all of the Brubaker House hosts for your openness to sharing your personal stories and photos and your enthusiasm around this exhibit. Um, thanks again to our sponsors, the Mennonite Historical Society of Ontario and Conrad Grable University College. And thanks especially to our exhibit curator and digital historian in residence, Bethany Lees, and web designer, Chris Steingart. So now I invite you all again to take some time to explore the exhibit at lifeupstairs.ca. There are so many more wonderful stories and especially photos that we were not able to showcase tonight, um, but I think you're in for a real treat. And if you enjoy the exhibit, please help us spread the word. Um, share the link with your friends and family and like our Facebook page in order to find out about future events and programs at Brubaker House. And finally, we do hope someday to meet you all in person. And we'd optimistically like to invite you to come to Brubaker <laughs> House for a tour next year during our museum season from May to October. Uh, we'll make sure to post on our website and Facebook page when we do reopen.